All right, so here we are at the Power Options. What we're looking at, of course, is a 14-day free trial. It's a Power Options. Those of you just getting started, I encourage you to take advantage of the four steps that you're seeing up at the top. But our first questions, first question, excuse me, that has come in is from Robert. And Robert wants to know, what percent do you think is a good return for a vertical or condor? Okay. I don't have an illustration for this directly, Robert, but uh, let's go ahead and go into the search. I'm going to look at some examples. I'll start off with bull put credit spread. Okay, let's start off with a bull put. Now, in a bull put credit spread, we're going to look to go out of the money a little bit below the current stock price. I'm going to sell a put that's below the current stock price, and then, of course, I'm going to buy a put at a higher strike price. Here we go. I'm sorry, I'm going to sell a put just below the current stock price, and then we're going to buy a put that's at a lower strike price as well. This is going to generate a credit. Our hope is the stock stays above the put strike price. Both puts expire worthless, and we keep the net credit. Okay, now, what is a good return? Well, it depends on your risk tolerance. Here, we see that we have several positions that are expiring 14 days away uh, on our weekly search. Some are five-point spreads. Some, such as General Motors up top, a 37-36 spread. We're just looking at a one-point spread. The, let's go to the profit and loss chart here very quickly. And what I want to look at here at the profit and loss chart is we're going to take a look, you know, just at the static setup. So General Motors is at 38.20. I'm looking 14 days out. I'm going to sell a 37 strike put for about 40 cents. I'm going to buy a 36 for 19. Okay, it's a lower volatility stock, so we're not looking at a lot of net credit. We have a one point spread. We're going to generate 21 cents of net credit. Now, the true risk on this spread is 79 cents. What does that mean? Well, that means that if the stock, let me change this real quick, <laughs> if the stock falls below $36 per share, unexpectedly, overnight perhaps, well, I'm going to be forced to potentially buy shares of stock at 37, but I've reserved the right to buy them at 36. Or if I close them out, buy to close the 37 put that I sold sell to close the 36 put that I bought, well, you know, pay maybe a dollar of intrinsic value, maybe a little bit more. But in the worst case scenario at expiration, if the stock's below 36, I'd be put stock at 37, my broker would immediately sell it at 36, I take a dollar loss, but I'm going to keep that 21 cent net credit, so the most I can lose is 79 cents. We're looking at close to a, let's just call it a four to one risk reward ratio. Okay. The maximum profit is 26.6%. Do I think that is a good return? Yes. Do, is this the normal return I look for? Not really. Okay. I look a little bit lower for certain credit spreads, maybe in the 10, 11, 12, or 15% range. Well, why would I do that if I can find credits here that are offering almost a 30% return for 14 days based on my investment? It's because it depends on which probability you look for. Back on the search tool, this GM position had about a 72-73% probability that the stock would remain above 37 in the next 14 days. That's pretty good. However, if I wanted to go higher, if my goal or my risk tolerance was 80% probability, I'm actually probably looking at the 36-35 spread that might only offer 12 cents, maybe 11 cents of net credit. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but over a $1 risk, or what would be 89 cents, we're still looking at about 11 to 12% yield with an 80% probability. So can I find spreads that have a 50% return? Absolutely. But we're only going to have a 50% probability of the stock staying above that strike and expiring worthless. Is it a good idea to take to be more aggressive and to take on that potentially higher return <clears throat> for a lower probability. Well, that depends on your personal risk threshold. That also depends on your sentiment in the market. If you're a little bit 
at e uneasy right now. You maybe feel that the last couple of days we've seen some hesitation in the market. What well, we saw hesitation on Wednesday, saw a big gap up, relatively good gap up Thursday, and then another pullback today before it settled down a little bit. Well, maybe you want to be deeper out of the money. Look for those 80% probabilities, even seven days out or five days out to the weeklies. Let's take a different view. And I'm just going to use a different stock here. Um, I want something with a decent amount of uh, spread width here. So we're going to go to what's called the spread chain tool under bull put credit. We're going to look one stock at a time. I'm going to go to Amazon, okay, a little higher price. And I'm going to use the standard March expiration, which is 14 days out. I'm going to put my spread width at five. So we're just going to look at five point spreads. Minimum net credit, hey, we want to be at least 20 cents. Well, maybe 30 cents. We'll put it at 25 for a five point spread. How about that? Out of the money, I'm just going to go 1%. Minimum return five, that's pretty good. I'm going to start off with just a probability of 70%. Ah, let's change it here. Also, I just wanted to look at, you know what? No, let me go back to there. Let's go back here. Okay. So what this chain shows us is we're looking at the combinations. Ah, wrong expiration. Let me go back to March 17th. Fantastic. Over here on the right-hand side, these are our bull put credit spreads for Amazon that expire on March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Over here on the left are our bear call credit spreads. Okay, So we see some of the same returns we saw, that 25.6% return with the stock at 849.14. I'm going to write it here so everyone can see it a little bit better. 849.14. And for the bull put side, I'm showing that I could sell the 835, 14 points below, and buy the 830. We get a net credit of 102, 25.6% yield with a 71% probability, 71.7. Okay? So, but I can go lower. I can go to the 825, 820, 24 points out of the money, get a 50 cent net credit. That's still on a five-point spread. That's an 11.1% return, and now I have an 83.8% probability. Okay. Usually my minimum to start off with is about 75% probability, which means I know I'm typically looking in this range, about 15% or lower. And if you want a 90% probability, you're probably looking at returns around 6 or 7%, 31 cent net credit off of a five-point risk but you've got a 90% probability. So I can't answer for you what is the best return to look for. When I use spreads, and by the way, I typically only do bear call credits and bull put credit spreads on the broad-based indexes, ETFs that have lower volatility. Very rarely will I look at positions on uh, standard stocks and I'll never trade any type of credit spread or iron condor on a stock that has earnings coming up between now and my expiration date that I'm evaluating. That's just a big no-no. It's just, you know, anytime you set up here, you know, we saw those 70% probabilities, a five-point spread with one or two uh, net credit, excuse me, you're looking at a four-to-one risk-reward ratio. Well, I went to 50 cents on a five-point spread with the 82, 83% probability. Now I'm kind of looking at, honestly, you know, 450, uh, to five, so I'm looking at a nine to one risk reward ratio. I know that one loss could wipe out nine previous gains. I don't take, want to take a loss in either situation, but that's what happens. And if we go to the 30 cents, we're looking at more along the lines of about a 14 or 15 to one percent, or 15 to one risk reward ratio. So it's a trade off. I can show you how to find spreads that have a 50 percent potential return. On Amazon, for example, I could probably sell the 850 put and buy the 845, and I'd probably have a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. But unless the stock's above 850, I'm not going to realize that return. If I'm bullish in 14 days and that happens, that's fantastic. I could have a 50% return on a credit spread with about a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio or a little bit higher, but pretty much in that realm. But again, I've only got a 50% probability that in the next 14 days, the stock's above 850, and I'd make that return. So it's a trade-off. It comes down to your risk tolerance. 
and what you're looking to do. Now, I look for the same type of numbers in an iron condor. Honestly, I have not traded iron condors in probably the past 18 months. Uh, the way that the market has been, you know, in the beginning of January of 2016, when we had that little hiccup down, and then SPY came back up, and then around March or May, there was another little dip, and then it was up, and then there was a little hiccup, and then we've been up and up and up, and now we're, you know, a little hesitation. Close, but not the exact chart that we saw for SPX and SPY. I would have gotten killed here on iron condors. Maybe even here, as it moved, or I should say here, as it moved back up. Then again here, and then again here. Now, if I was trading bull puts, I would have had to manage here, and manage here, and maybe here. But overall, I would have been consistent. If I did bear calls, I would have done really well here, 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 and here. But as long as I stayed deep enough out of the money, I would have been okay with those gradual rises. But I honestly haven't traded iron condors in a while. Even though I'd set my probability, what's called the probability between, the likelihood that the stock would stay below my short call strike on the bear call and above the short put strike on my bull put side, combine the two together on the same stock. Even though I'm looking for probabilities above 80 or 82 percent, well, to tell you the truth, I've seen most iron condors require too much management over the course of a 12-month period in the last 18 months, so I've just been doing directional one way or the other. So that's the best way I can answer your question. I look for around, let's say, 11 to 15 percent returns, keeping with that probability, usually above 78 percent, depending on market conditions, but I like to be in that 80 percent range if possible. You've got a higher... Uh, risk threshold, you, you feel that you can take a little bit more risk, and uh, you can do that up, okay? All right. Okay, so Ron asked a question. I'm going to go, I know there's three more questions that came in before Ron's, uh, but Ron asked, is the percent return an annualized return? When I'm on the search, Ron, this return here is the static return over 14 days. Look, for that uh, General Motors position, now let me try to go back, maybe I should just go back to here. Okay, we'll go back to our uh, spread positions here um, ah, for Amazon. Let's go to March 17th. There we go. Sorry about that. This return is static. That's at 14 days. Okay, so let's take that. Uh, we lost a little premium here. But let's say this 830, 835, five-point spread, let's see we gained a dollar. We got a dollar net credit instead of 96 cents. What's a dollar net credit off a risk of four? Well, in this case, I'm sorry, it's 96 cents off of a risk of 404, right? Because I had a five-point spread, but I keep the credit. So that would be a 23.8% return on the $4.04 I'd have to have on margin to cover the difference in strike prices. 14 days, the stock stays above 835, both puts expire, I keep 96 cents, my 404 is free, that's 23.8% on the monetary value I had to have on hold to place the trade. The number here in parentheses on the spread chain, that's your annualized return. If I'm able to get 23.8% every 14 days for the next 365 days, I'd have an annualized return of 619%. Okay? I know that wouldn't happen. There's always going to be strings of winners and losers, and you're always going to have to manage those positions as well, Ron. Um, so the static return you're seeing is in 14 days. It's not annualized. So yeah. If I'm looking 14 or 20 days out, as I mentioned, I'm looking for that 10 or 12%, maybe 15% return. That's for that time frame off of the money I have invested or have to have on hold in the position, okay? Um, I just had a thought on that. Something else to consider, uh, Robert, that I did not get to um, that I should have mentioned. Return is also based on your time frame. These are 14 day out trades when we're seeing this is in the 14 day out trades this is probably the range I want to look for in around this 14 to 11 percent looking for probabilities in the higher 70s to 80 ranges okay the probabilities there for these positions now if I go just to five days out let's call it seven days out instead of going eight to 14 days out if I just went two to nine days out looking for next Friday there's two things I have to consider one, if you're looking for 20% returns on a standard monthly bull put, you know, 30 days out, you feel that that's possible with good probability. If you go into weekly, you're going to have to expect a little bit lower, right? If you want that same 80% probability, we're talking about 5% returns, 7% returns, 
because you're going to get a lower net credit. You go 14 days out, go up to 15 or 16. We go 30 days out. I might find, let's try it. I'm going to create just a basic search in bull puts real quick. Let's empty all the filters out. I know there's a lot of positions that have weekly, so I'm going to go to all expirations. Now I'm going to go 22 to 35 days out in time. I'm going to look for a minimum net credit of 25 cents to start. Let's go at least 5% out of the money. And so, let's go 80. Let's go straight 80% probability. Um, to cut down the results here, I'm going to make sure that I avoid earnings between now and expiration. And I'm going to look for stocks that are just trading in an uptrend, okay? So just a stock trading above the 50-day moving average, all right? 14 positions offer a return of greater, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't even put in return. So if I put in 10% return on stocks trending in an uptrend that have an 80% probability, um, don't have earnings between now and expiration, you see we're in that 10% that range. There's only six that match that. Are there spreads that have a higher uh, return, 20, 30%? Absolutely. They're not going to have an 80% probability and be at least 5% out of the money. Um, are there positions that may be in a downtrend that would offer that? Of course. But these are the things I looked at. But that's 30 days out. I'm going to use the same criteria. Again, minimum 10% return, 5% out of the money, 80% probability. And let's go two to nine days out. None. Nothing is at least 5% out of the money offering a 10% return and an 80% probability. Why? Because we're closer in time, so I have to lower this down to maybe 1% out of the money for the next five days. So the cushion between your short put strike price and the stock price is going to have to be lowered. Probability can stay the same, but that's going to have to be lowered simply because you're closer in time. You're not going to get the credit you want with the probability. All right. So that's just another example. It also depends the thoughts we just, the comments we just had on the bull puts uh, related to probability return. Everything works hand in hand and range out of the money. If you're going shorter term, you're not going to be able to go five, six, seven percent out of the money and see those twenty percent returns in a seven day trade. Fourteen or twenty days out, maybe go up to three, four, or five percent. And if we go a full month out in time, we might be able to go up eight percent out of the money still get our 10% return and our desired net credit. It's always a trade-off between those sort of three or four criteria there. The credit, return, out of the money slash probability. They all work hand in hand together. Okay. Okay. Uh, JL says, I've started trading in the money covered calls. Short term, seven to eight days out. Does power options have a screening mode for this? Absolutely. Just as we set up the out of the money range with the bull put, see the same criteria in covered call. So let's go to covered call, JL. Let me go to search. And we do have some default in the money searches that you can use. You know, weekly picks of the day, um, but those are, you know, at or slightly in the money. You know, some of these are in the money as well um, for the weekly picks of the day, 2469. Uh, looking at the March 10th, 24 strike. Okay, so these most of these here on this weekly picks of the day that Ernie back tested and put the criteria together, they're going to be there. But if you have your own specifics of what range you want to be in the money for seven to eight days, but still receiving a good return, here's my suggestion: covered call, go into search. You can use the weekly picks of the day as a starting point, or just hit clear filters. Empty everything out of your parameter field. Days to expiration, uh, just as I did on the last bull put search, I'm going to put in days to expiration of two to nine. Why? Well, going at least two days out filters out today's expiration, and uh, it's a computer, so I don't want to go six to seven days because this reads that it has to be, if I put in six to seven in my days to expiration, it would filter out the seven days out because it's not looking at equal to, it's looking at less than. So I want to go about nine days out in time, and I want to, you know, go two days to eradicate the current Friday expiration that still technically is one day left as it expires tomorrow. All right. In the money range, what's your range in the money? If you want to do it by number of strikes, you want to be at least two strikes in the money, you can do it there. If you want percent in the money, let's be bold. 
a little bit more protection. Let's say we want to be at least 3% in the money. But I still want a reasonable return. My return, if assigned, if the stock stays above that strike for seven-day trade, let's just put 0.4% or more. Uh, the return, if unchanged, would be equal if we're already starting in the money. But, you know, I want some downside protection. The intrinsic value I'm collecting on the call plus whatever little time premium is there for that deep in the money call for seven days out in time, let's put it at least 2%. Okay, so if I sold uh, the 100, I'm sorry, I bought a stock at 100 and I'm selling the 97 or the 95 call, I want the downside protection to be at least 2%. Okay, so the stock can fall 2% before I'm technically losing money on the position. And that's really it to start with. And then again, I'd recommend you go into the fundamentals, select that earnings date not between now and expiration, and then maybe put in some fundamentals you'd look for for a good stock. Maybe you just want mid to large cap stocks. You can fill in the market capitalization field here. Uh, if you want stocks to show good earnings per share growth, and uh, excuse me, JL, you know your account size. I don't know yours. So you'd probably have a stock price range. Maybe you're not trading stocks for your covered call where you have to buy the stock where the stocks are above 150. So let's just go 5 to 150. And the technicals, you might want a stock that's trading in an uptrend, maybe above the 20-day or 50-day moving average. And I want some good volume. Uh, this is measured in thousands, actually. If you hover over it, you get a pop-up definition. Put in my average stock volume of 750 or more, so I see stocks that trade uh, on average over the last 90 days at least 750,000 shares per day. All right, that's it. What have we got? Was I too restrictive? No. Oh. Well, here's another tip for you. I'm overloaded here with the three times bull and some uh, pharmaceuticals there, some other good companies as well. But I might not want to trade the three times bull or bear ETFs. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into lists. And I'm going to go into the exclude function. And I'm going to select to remove leveraged ETFs, anything that's a 2x or 3 times bull or bear ETF. They move too quickly, um, even going, you know, reasonable range in the money. Let's go ahead and submit that. All right. So now you've got a pharmaceutical in there, but you do have U.S. Steel, uh, Chamorz, um, First Solar, Mobile Eye, uh, Tenet Healthcare. Why am I not seeing a lot more trades if my uh, criteria was pretty open? Now, well, it's because it probably went too deep in the money honestly. Uh, let's try this. Let's go down to 2% in the money or more. And the same thing we did, maybe you want a good probability of being assigned of at least, say, 70%, maybe 65. Let's put in 65 to start. So we won't go as deep in the money, but we'll still look for that good return. So, okay, we open it up. Now we've got gap, 2469. That's the same one that showed up on the weekly. The 24 call, 1.1% if assigned, a 3.8 downside protection. Okay, and U.S. Steel is still up there too, the 37.74, we could sell the 36.5 uh, call against it, 1.4 yield, but it's a 67.5% probability. This gave us about 50 results. I could narrow that down further and say, you know what, if I'm happy with 65, I'm going to be happy with probabilities greater than 70. Show me what you got. All right, so we just make that change. Now we're down to 32. Maybe we could go up to 75 and see if there's anything that matches uh, those uh, results as well. Okay, so I would start off, when you go into power options, start with the weekly picks of the day, maybe as a default, a stepping stone to create your own personal search, but then at any time just hit clear filters, set your expiration date. I suggest all expirations from two to nine days out. That'll get you into the weeklies. And then set your downside protection and your goals for minimum percent if assigned that matches your trading plan. Put in your probability. Again, I'd avoid earnings between now and expiration. And of course, I'd put in the stock price as a minimum filter. You know, why? Well, if I ran the search and let's say Amazon came up again at $849 and I'm not planning on buying 100 shares of Amazon at $849 to do a covered call, why would I want to see it in my results? I want to match the stock price range to what I'm willing to pay and what I'm willing to, to put out that I can afford with my account based on my trading plan and how many positions I want open. All right, so that's how I would set up the covered call screen for in the money. General rule, when setting up any search, 
whether you're doing credit spreads, whether you're doing covered calls, whether you're doing calendar calls, whether you're buying calls, long calls or long puts, go into the search and clear the filters first. Put in the five or six criteria that mean the most to you. You asked me that you want to do in the money covered calls with, uh, that were just seven days out. To me, that gives me four criteria right off the bat. Number one, the expiration time frame. If I wanted to do standard monthly covered calls, I would just go to March or to April. If I wanted a wider range of, say, any weeklies, I could select all expirations. Let's say go to 2 to 35. See anything that's one week out, two week out, three, so on and so forth. You get the idea. Set your expiration time frame. Set your goals for the return of the position. And for a long call, that might be the maximum cost you're willing to pay for the option. There's also a field there called percent to double putting your range in or out of the money that matches your needs. So you, all you told me was that you wanted to go in the money with shorter term periods. Well, that also tells me that, sure, you want to be in the money, you want a high probability, and you have a sit and expiration time frame. But I also know that you want to want some return. You're not going to be happy with 0.1%. Maybe you are. You know, 0.1% for seven days. That's fine. If you want to go deep, deep in the money, 80% probability, and look for 0.1%, just change the values that match your trading plan and what you're looking for. And then never forget, put in the fundamentals that make sense. If you're doing a bullish strategy, you know, make sure you're maybe looking at mid to large cap stocks. You don't want anything fly by night. Maybe a good earnings per share growth for the bullish positions, bull put credits, collars. You know, look for stocks that have grown at least 5% in earnings from last year to this year. Anything that you're selling, a covered call, a cash secured naked put, Bull put credit, bear call, iron condor. Uh, calendar call spread, calendar put spread. I highly recommend selecting not between now and expiration. Because even though in some of these positions we see here, I've got a good 5% downside protection, for example, in U.S. Steel. Well, if there's a, earnings come out and the stock drops 15%, I'm still down 10% on my position in a seven-day period. Now I've got to manage it. You know, I might have to, if I'm only getting 1% per week, if I'm lucky, Okay, but let's say I'm getting 0.5% per week. That's going to take me 20 to 25 weeks to get back to break even at that premium. Now, hopefully the stock comes back up, but if it doesn't, why would I want to risk that? Why would I want to risk getting into a high probability bull put spread, doing all that research and saying this is the stock I feel is going to stay up. I want the 80% probability. I've got an 11% return. It's a 14-day trade, but it's got earnings come out in five days. Why would I want to put myself in a situation where the unexpected could wipe out my return and wipe out nine previous gains. I don't do it. I'll look for the positions that don't have an earnings between now and expiration as well. So if you have a general rule of thumb, three or four criteria in a search or in a strategy, go into the search, clear out the filters, put in those three or four, run the results. Now if you have 150 or 200 results, that's okay. Put in some other criteria that you'd want to use. Hey, I want stocks in an uptrend. Maybe you want a certain Bollinger Band or MACD range as well. Do that also. Okay? So it's really easy to customize the search based on your specific needs. And while we're here, there's two things I want to show you. Okay? At any time on Power Options, you can go into the free webinar section. And this is a public page. So even if right now though some of you online are not a current trial member or a subscriber to Power Options, this is a public page, powerop.com slash webinars.asp. I'll send that to everyone in the chat window. Now, here's a one we did about a month ago, a webinar we, oh, sorry, webinar we did a month ago on setting up the search tool. Navigating the search tool, discussion on sample searches and default parameters, how to set up the search from scratch and more. Here's a presentation you'll find interesting, just searching for covered calls. Okay, just how to set up the search for different types of covered calls, in the money, out of the money, weekly, standard expiration, dividend paying stocks, full webinar, just on using the search for covered calls. Try to cover as much as possible. Now, that's in the Power Options Tools section. In the Options Strategies section, you'll see uh, different ones for selection criteria for long options, how to set up the search for buying calls or buying puts. Um, let's see here. Da, da, da. Okay, sorry. Um, there we go. In the Introduction to Naked Puts, we talk about that as well. And uh, some of the spread positions, vertical spreads, a hands-on look. We talk about how to set up the search for those positions as well, and also collars 
uh, in here. So there's a bunch of different webinars that will teach you how to use the search tool, not only the basics and the generalness of it, but for a specific strategy. All right, Stanley made a comment here, said, uh, Power Options has a sell warning. Is it strong enough that I should be using bull call credit? Well, if it's a sell warning, Stanley, I don't know if I want to be in a bull call credit right now, right? What he's talking about is our little market sentiment tool over here on the left-hand side. This is something Ernie put together over about, uh, he put it up about a year and a half ago, I believe, and it was after maybe another previous year and a half of exhaustive research and analysis. And what he did is he looked at how these 13 broad-based indicators would react to market increases and market decreases. Oh, you meant bear call credit, yeah. Well, so what this tool does is it looks at the 13 broad-based indicators, and over time, I'm gonna take the put call volume ratio. What Ernie looked at the values over about an eight to 10 year period was how often do these certain ratios that he have hit a certain price. So the put call volume ratio right now is at 0.72. And so it's right here in the middle, it's, and that's where it shows bearish to bullish. So what we'd notice, if we had a put call volume ratio, and this is across the entire market, by the way, the entire market put call volume ratio, when it gets to about 0.99 or 1, for example, that's a bullish indicator, telling us very rarely does it continue to move up. It's going to start pulling back. Okay, when that, when that pulls back, of course, is usually when the market's going up. Okay, so when it's above 1, that's usually a bullish. Now, this is a, a contrary indicator. It might not have been the best one to choose. And when it's down to about 0.6, you see it very rarely on the histogram goes below that. Okay, so when the market comes back up, the put call ratio balances out. So when we see this trigger, it's bearish. When we're up here, it's bullish. The VIX is kind of an obvious one, isn't it? And we can just look at that right now. The VIX is currently at 1096. It's over here. Okay, it's reached over the last eight years, it's reached 11 only 3.8% of the time. And it only goes to 10 about 0.7%. So what does that tell me? Well, the idea is, and you all know this, but it's just part of the indicators, all the other indicators combined. But when we see the VIX under 11, that's usually a bearish indicator. We'd expect a decrease in the market. What happens with a decrease in the market? Well, that's when the VIX starts moving back up. Okay, the volatility increases because the market's falling. So in general, in general, again, past, based on past history, the fences are set based on when we saw the latest, latest market low, and the uh, latest market high, uh, you know, what were the values here? It was about 18 on the VIX on 11.15, 2012, and no, I'm sorry, the, no, I'm sorry, yeah, it was a 17.98 at the market low, and the volatility was increased. So when it goes up to 17 or 18, guess what? That means we kind of want to think it's going to start going back the other way, all right? So, you know, most of them are things related to SPF. The relative strength index of the, of the RSI is now in a bearish mode. The number of days SPX has been over its 20-day moving average is bearish. So usually when you see a trend of you know, 10 or 15 days above the 20-day moving average, there's a retracement. So it's in a bearish mode. So is this a good time to do bear call credit spreads? I would say so, potentially. I'm not going to make that suggestion. Um, yes, I am, but <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not giving direct advice. But what we expect to see is to see a market pullback when the sell warning comes up. For example, I had a call today, uh, I don't know if any of you are Fusion subscribers and are following my trades at RadioactiveTrading.com on the Fusion subscription. I was in eBay today. Oh, I've been in eBay for a while. I'm in a married put with a July 33 strike put, guaranteeing I can't lose more than 5.5% on the position. And I had sold today's, the 3rd of March, 34 call. Now, last week it had gone above 34, went to 34.03, 34.12, and I didn't roll it because Back on 221 is when the first sell warning came up. And I figured, you know what? If that's true, and I, this, I usually follow my trades this way, I'm going to give it some time. Because if the market pulls back, I don't want to pay a lot of money now to buy back that position and then roll it up. Now, was it accurate? Let me go back a little bit further here. But at this point in 221, the SPX was at 2365. And it did drop down. Dropped down and went to neutral, so the market came back up, 2369. 
and then it dropped down a little bit, but then, you know, it really had that pop again, as I mentioned, on Wednesday, right? We jumped up to 23.95, but it was a sell warning. It triggered uh, more than four bearish indicators, and we dropped yesterday, kind of dropped today. We also had having the market drop this morning, and then it came back up a little bit towards the end, but it was about a wash, wasn't it? It was about even. Let's see. Let me go back a little bit. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do it on this one. I'm not on my personal account, so I'm not going to be able to go back. But when I see a sell warning, let me go back to real time. When I see a sell warning, if I have a married put in place, I'm usually looking to sell a call against it right at the money, or maybe a little bit out of the money. Why? Because if the market pulls back those next couple days, I'll be able to get the better premium and be able to buy it back cheaply. If I'm in a bull put, and I see this go to five, and it kind of increases the sell warning, it goes to a, a bearish sell warning, I might consider closing out my bull puts if they're profitable, if we're near a high at this point, because I don't want to take the chance that it's going to fall, and I'm going to have to manage them later for a loss. Both Ernie and I use this tool as not only a means of deciding what positions we might enter. Ernie might open broad-based spread. I think he did the other day. He opened a, a bear call credit spread on SPX uh, for the Optium subscription at Power Options Applied uh, when he saw the sell warning. Okay, the first time the sell warning came up earlier this week, uh, right around Wednesday, I believe it was. Yeah, it was Wednesday, 3-1. That's when I think he did the bear call credit spread on SPX. Now, if he sees it reverse and it goes neutral and the market starts to come up, he may choose to adjust it or he may add the bull put to complete the iron condor. It depends. Uh, but I use this tool to help me, um, if I have a short call open that's right at the money, let's say eBay, for example, uh, the one that was today. The reason why I left it open, I'm sorry, I didn't finish the complete thought. I got distracted. But I left the call open on eBay. I didn't buy it back when I saw the sell warning because I was going to pull back. So, of course, today, yes, in the last 10 minutes, I was watching it because eBay was around 33.75, 33.76. And I didn't want to pay to buy it back. I just wanted the call to expire worthless. I didn't want to give the market maker the satisfaction. I didn't want to pay the um, commission cost on it. So I just waited, and sure enough, it expired worthless. I didn't panic when it went to 34.12, 34.15. I felt that there was a little bit overbought, that we were going to see a pullback. The sell warning verified it. I left it alone. I could have been assigned early, but two days later it pulled back down, and then it dropped a little bit further, and I was more comfortable with the position. Okay, So I use this to, yes, help me decide which positions I'm going to open, but at the same time, help me manage my positions that are open as well. Um, but on the eBay one, by the way, if it was today, it is today, <laughs> If I had the 34 call out to March 17th, again, happy St. Patrick's Day, um, and 14 days out in time, and eBay was right at 33.89, I had the 34 call, and this was opposite. It showed me a uh, bullish buy or strong bullish buy or strong buy warning. I might be very tempted to buy to close that call today even if it was a loss, because if the market goes up four or five, or my stock, I should say, goes up three or four percent in the next sort of uh, five days, 10 days, 12 days, I don't want to be where I was out of the money on the call to end the money, now I've got to pay more to roll it and try to find a higher strike price, okay? Might want to get that call out of the way, let it go up until it goes to neutral, and then sell the call at that next peak, okay? Um, calendar spreads, I treat the same way. You know, if I'm in a calendar call and I see a sell warning, I'm being, okay, I can leave the short call alone, but let's see how bad the drop is. If I start to see a strong bear warning, I might close out of that calendar spread because I don't want to take too big of a loss on the far out option. Uh, reverse, if it's right at the money or just a little bit below and I see a, a, a buy warning, I may be tempted to move that short call before the move happens or just buy it back, wait to see if the move does happen, and then sell a higher strike. And of course, you want to see some more information about how I use this tool to help me manage my positions. If you go to the market sentiment, uh, you can access that from the main home menu as we saw. It was one of the pods there. But also if you go into the signature tools, but once you go into the market sentiment here to see the different fences, you can do the research and see what fences we've set and the histograms for each of the indicators. There's a help video here that kind of walks through what I just walked through but gives a little bit more examples of what I might do if I see a sell warning, a bearish sell, a buy uh, signal or a strong buy based on what positions I have open and what's available. On a side note, 
Um, I don't have a poll set up for this at all. It's just something that came to my mind. Um, this, this is a good crowd today. It's a very good crowd. Um, nah, let's ignore that. I'm just going to ask generally and have you guys uh, send in, your, uh, send in a, a question here, yes or no, or raise your hand. How many of you today, or this week, saw the massive competition in our favor as investors of the lower commission rates from all the brokerage houses. Fidelity dropped their stock commissions down from uh, 795 for 100 shares to 495, as did, I believe, E-Trade, um, as did, uh, there's another one I was just thinking of that Ernie was talking about. I don't think it was Options Express. It might have been Options Express, actually. Uh, TD Ameritrade, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, TDA did, too. Um, it wasn't just one. It was pretty much all of them, I think, have now decided that, oh, Schwab did also. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, I was, I'm, I was pretty sure it was all of them, but we just wanted to verify that. We saw it on Fidelity, um, Options Express, Schwab, of course, uh, TD Ameritrade. Uh, I believe E-Trade did the same thing, um, and a couple of others. I guess they all decided that, yeah, they're still receiving good volume in options trading, but uh, I think they're losing out to Thinkorswim and to Interactive Brokers. I know Trade King was always relatively low, but they might have dropped theirs as well. So it now seems the new standard for options is going to be around that $495 between all of them just to try to get a little bit more competitive. And it was amazing to me how it was almost a flood. I saw one do it, and then within, you know, they've been planning it for months, obviously, because they have to do all the background work and everything else. But they were all planning on this launch, and they all did it together because they knew that people would, you know, if they waited seven days after one of them did it, they knew that their more active customers would start comparing and maybe jumping ship before they lowered it too. So yay for us as investors, all right? Yay for us as options investors. We get a little bit of break now. It seems that everyone is lowering their commissions, of course, except for probably interactive brokers and thinkorswim because they were already at that level to begin with, so they don't want to drop any lower. But hey, it's good news for us, isn't it? All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 5.21 p.m. Eastern time. Oh, no, it's not. It's 5.16 p.m. Eastern Time, just moving to 5.17 based on my computer. Uh, I don't have any other new questions that are have come in. So I want to encourage you guys, if you have any other questions, uh, last-minute questions you want to ask or any thoughts about what we presented already, talking about the probability and return on the bull put and bear call credit spreads and the iron condors, um, questions about you know in-the-money covered calls or setting up the search for in-the-money covered calls, or, of course, what we just discussed um, using the market sentiment tool uh, for direction as well. You know, put those in as well. we still got about uh, 12 minutes left. Going back to our conversation a moment ago, not a moment ago, but earlier in the webinar, we were asking about return and probabilities of um, bull put spreads. Robert's true question was bull put spreads and iron condors, or credit spreads, I should say, and iron condors. I didn't go into iron condors. I want to take some time to do that now. I'm going to add iron condor here uh, to our screen. Now, the way we calculate returns for the iron condor and power options is, what is an iron condor first off? Okay, well, sometimes I get this question. An iron condor is simply just the combination of a bull put credit spread. Let's say if I break it right here. A combination of doing that bull put credit spread we were talking about, which might have that 75 percent probability and 11 percent return by itself and the bear call that also is out of the money has a 75 percent probability and 11 percent return on the position combined together on the same stock with the same expiration date so now as long as the stock stays above the short put but below the short call ends in the middle everything expires worthless and we keep the money okay all right, so, but the question was, what about probabilities? Well, there's two ways to set that up. I'll go through that very quickly, and then I did just get another uh, question come in from Wesley, and uh, another question came in from JL. So just give me that in a moment. So does it, but well, how we calculate the return here is, I should go, I should have gone back, but that's okay. But on that iron condor, we know that if you're losing on the put side, you're winning better on the call side, right? Call side is safer if you're losing on the put side, and the put side safer if you're losing on the call side, which means you can only lose on one side or the other in most situations. So 
you really only have to cover the risk, and most brokers only charge this, on one side of that spread or the other. You don't have to cover both, which means that if I go into an iron condor, let me clear the filters, and we look for our, we're going to use our weeklies just as we did with our bull puts. We go two to nine days out. We want to be at least 2% out of the money for the short put and 2% out of the money for the short call. I still want a net credit maybe now of 30 cents ah, for a nine-day trade. Yeah, that's pretty good. And I'm going to keep the return at 10%. Okay. Um, but what we want to do now is I can still put in the probability above the short put strike of 75, the probability above the short call strike at 75, but at the same time, the probability between the strikes of, let's say, 75 or greater. So it's not just the probability below the short call strike or above the short put strike. I'm looking at a 75% probability between. Now, what this also means, what return might I look for? Well, depending again on your risk threshold and how far out of the money you want it to go, you can look for a higher return because we're calculating it based on one side or the other. So if I was doing a five-point bull put spread, as we were looking earlier on Amazon, and it's offering me a 10% return, if I did the opposite, I did the bear call side, well, let's just go there, take a look. So here, I'm sorry, let's do this with our, uh, you know, here's our 12.4% return with the 825, 820 which had a probability of 84.5%, 84.6%, right? Okay, so there's our bull put. But I could combine that with the 875, 880, 84%, getting another 46 cents of net credit. And okay, here's 55. So if I take 55 and 45, roughly, by doing this bear call, 875, 880, my 825, 820 bull put, I get a dollar net credit, but guess what? My broker is likely only going to charge me here or here for the margin, five point spread. So it's one over four. I still have my probabilities below and above, and I'd want that probability between to be about 80, but now I'm looking at a 25% return instead of a 12. So yeah, I, I, sh I should have mentioned that when we were looking at those, but here's a good example. You might be able to double that return when looking at an iron condor, but you still want the same probabilities as well. Okay, JL said, during my trial, I received daily emails from you addressing optimal covered calls. Is that a normal service, and what is the key system? Good question. The Price Watch Alert morning update is sent to you, trial members and subscribers, uh, of course, as a perk. There's a covered call search that's in uh, the def one of the default covered call search is called Morning Update Price Watch Alerts, okay? Now, this is run by a third-party system. They use our patented search tool to generate search results uh, at the close of business every previous day, and they send it out to their subscribers and our trial members and subscribers as well. That's the Morning Update, the Price Watch Alerts. I don't have, I, I, had, I sent an email to a customer today actually regarding the Morning Update and the Price Watch Alerts. Uh, with the covered calls. I don't have any statistics for you how well these perform. I don't track them. I don't look at them historically. It's not being run by Ernie and myself. Um, actually, I think we removed it from here, and that, that's perfectly fine. I'll explain why in a moment. But there was a default that used to be here um, called Price Watch Alerts Morning Updates. We changed it. Why? Because the monthly picks of the day default search that Ernie put in uh, here, the monthly picks of the day for covered calls and right now for naked puts are actually tested historically, and I've been tracking them in my portfolio since Ernie released them, and we're confident in their return, their performance, where we don't have the numbers of the performance of the last four years, five years, six years of the price watch alerts. Our goal of the price watch alerts is that when you receive that email and something interests you, you will log on to Power Options and further research and analyze those. And to follow up your question, you can look at them any time, by the way. Let's go to the Home menu, and let's go to Learning Center. Da, 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 I don't even think I'm in the right place. I haven't had to go in here in a while. Priority One Email Archive. And here are the morning updates that are sent out. Okay. Now, your follow-up and the other question, this mention here, this risk assessment of this trade is three keys, moderate. Three keys, three keys, two keys, considerable to relative risk. 
I don't know what goes into that. I've asked them twice over the past six months because we've had questions from you guys on what is their key rating, and they are trying to keep it proprietary, the service that runs these, of course. So they're trying to keep it proprietary in uh, their service there and not let us know what it is. And, of course, I hate to say it this way because everyone gets this with different services, but I think they're trying to get you to ask them so they can try to sell you their stuff. Um, but, you know, we do that as just a perk because they're already using our tool to send it out, and we ask that they send it out to our subscribers. But our goal is when you receive that – oh, sorry, I went to the wrong place – go ahead and research and analyze those positions. If you see something interesting, you're using the uh, various tools and power options. But I would suggest maybe taking out the monthly picks of the day or on the search in covered call, go to the weekly or the monthly picks of the day. And by the way, because it's in the search here as a default, you can choose over here to have these results emailed to you every morning as opposed to the morning update price watch alerts. Okay. Fan. Okay, fantastic question by Wesley. I love it. And I don't have a follow-up to your second question, Wesley, but I'm going to do it. Wesley says that I feel AMD will gain 2% and I don't want to buy the stock. What option should I buy? Can I scan for the best option to buy? Well, I can go into long call or long put, of course, and uh, part of your question is something I can't answer. So go to long call and I can go into the search for the long call, and as before, can you search for the best long call? Well, yeah, but it depends on what you consider the best long call. Is it three to four months out in time? Is it two to three weeks out in time? Is it in the money? Is it out of the money? We've put these default criteria together for you to use as a stepping stone. This one here is doing Bollinger Bands. We're looking for Bollinger Band breakouts as an indication of a long call movement, but I've got a tool that's perfect for you. I don't know what AMD is at right now. Let's take a look here. I'm going to go to AMD. Let's see where we're at. AMD is at 13.03. All right, so you've got a very tight movement there of 2%. So 2% of 13 would be 26 cents. So let's go ahead and say we think the stock's going to be at 13.30. Okay? Now, hmm, we go back to long call. You can use a tool called the long option finder. I'll put in my stock symbol, AMD. My expected price of the stock is $13.30. The investment amount, let's say 1000 just for now, don't know. And the expected date. Now, this is optional, but I'm hoping that you think that this is going to be in the next 10 days or so. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go March 11th. Okay, here we go. What that tool did in that instant is show you, based on the theoretical pricing models and the current prices of the option, the first option listed, your March 11 call, currently priced at 209, and if you invested $1,000, you could buy four contracts. So your total cost would be about 838, and the theoretical value, of course, for your 11 call, if the stock goes to 1330 on 311, it's going to be 916. So you're going to have a profit of about 9%. Okay, so you'd say, oh, the out of the monies, wouldn't they work better? No. So right now, you see the 11s and the 12s. If I bought a 12-strike call based on the current price for March 17th expiration or March 24th, the stock only moved up to 13.30, it's showing you to actually lose money or it'd be less than a 7% gain. That's not why it's in here. Okay, so let's, let's try to do this, let's say, by the 9th. It moves up to 13.30. Okay, see, now there's the 12 call. I had to move the expiration a little bit. And this will give you about a 15% return based on the theoretical prices. You would pay 112 for it right now. The stock went up to 1330 the day before expiration. Yeah, you'd expect to be around 130, 131. So you'd make that 15% return or so on the position. Okay, and the 11 and a half and so on and so forth. Why wouldn't the 13 work? Well, it's probably because you're paying 30 to 40 cents for it right now, the at the money call with a stock at 13, if it goes up to 1330, you're not going to realize a profit in this time frame for these expirations. What a further out option, why aren't the Aprils showing up? It's because that movement is too small to realize a profit for something going out to April or May. You'd need a larger move in the stock. See, so watch, let's go to April. I'm going to, oh, sorry, folks. I'm going to select our time frame to be April on the long call, April 14th. 
Okay, so they're 5%, 4%. So there are some that are profitable, I apologize, but they're the deep in the monies because the movement is so small and you're only talking about a 20 cent gain. Okay, that's 5%, it's 20 cents on a $5. Why are you not seeing the 12 or the 13? Because if the time passed, that much time passed, you only saw a 2% gain, those calls would not be profitable. You'd lose more time value than you'd gain intrinsically. Okay, but that's what this tool does. You put in your expectation for the price of the stock, your target date and what you expect, uh, how much you're gonna invest, and this tool will show you which calls would give you the best bang for the buck if the stock did hit your price on your expected date, assuming volatility and other uh, factors remain the same as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Oof. Okay. Um, and I don't mean oof is in bad. I mean oof. This is a strategy that gets me. And I'm not a fan of it 100%. So, uh, oh, to answer your other question, I'm sorry, that came in, Wesley, this is the tool you want to use. The long option finder will show you which tool will give you the best results based on your target price, the best theoretical results based on your target price and your expectation. What is my opinion on what is called Option Lab? Uh, I've never seen it, never looked at it, never used it. So I can't give you any opinion one way or the other. I'm sure it's a useful tool. I've just never seen it, so I can't compare it to mine. Oh. All right, Stanley. Is it Stanley? Yeah, Stanley. Do you have stats on using a covered combo? Looks to have a good profitability. Maybe, but don't use it now. <laughs> if you think the market's pulling back, do not use that strategy now. That's all I'm going to say. Covered combination. Idea or concept, is, as I know, made popular by a group out in Texas that used to advocate getting into stock uh, by buying shares of stock now, selling a call, and at the same time selling it out of the money put. So if the stock fell, you'd buy more to help you average down, and then you'd sell another call against it. Okay, That's the covered combo. I buy stock, do a covered call, and at the same time sell an out of the money naked put. Why don't I like this strategy? Number one, remember, oh, let's go, is there a stock in here that's familiar with everybody? MTZ, BOFI, Vail, eh, some couple of them. ABX, I'm just going to use ABX for now. Yeah, that's a good one. Graphically, I should say that's a good one. All right, so what have I done here? I'm going to buy shares of stock of Barrick Gold at 1824. I'm going to give myself some upside. I'm going to sell the 19 call for 72 cents, and at the same time, I'm going to sell the 17 put for 49 cents. Okay, so, so that's a naked put and a covered call. You're double dipping. That's all. So originally, if I did this, of course, my out-of-pocket cost would be 1703. Not so fast. The stock and the short call do not cover your obligation of the put. So to do 100 shares, I have to put out the $1,800. I get 72 back. I get 49. But now I've got to put up another $1,700 to cover the obligation of the short put. So now my obligation is 3403. Okay, that's what I have. I have the 1703 out of pocket into the stock. And I've got 1700 on hold in my account to cover the short put. So I've got 3403 invested. Now, is it profitable? Sure, if it gets assigned, yeah, you make an extra profit. Where's the problem? Okay, long term, let me ask you this. You don't have to answer this, Stanley, but if you're just a covered call trader and you've been doing covered calls for five months, six months, a year, 18 months, and you tell me that you just feel that this return is, is not that this is a good return, by the way, it's a huge return, but you feel that you haven't been making ground with your covered calls. Maybe you've been just at or out of the money and the stocks are falling slightly and they're expiring worthless, okay? And maybe you even have a 60% success rate. Maybe 60% of the time you get assigned and you make the full return. 20% of the time the stock falls more than you expected and you're taking a big loss and then 20 to 15 percent of the time the stock sort of middles about your call expires but you're just about to break even so you keep selling and you keep selling and you keep selling okay now I don't want to be overly negative about the covered combination strategy but let's think for a minute where you are in your personal account and this I may be completely incorrect on this Stanley and that's fine I know we've talked before and I'm not saying this is your account if an investor comes to me and says I'm not making enough money with covered calls because the premium I'm selling isn't countering the losses. I, I'm getting more losses um, than the wins, or I'm even winning more than I'm losing, but I'm not getting ahead because the losses are taking away too much of the wins more than what I'm winning. 
but I saw this neat strategy of doing a covered combination where I am going to be able to get more premium up front. This was the April 21st, wasn't it? Yeah, that's why it's so high. Get more premium up front, almost twice the premium, by also selling the naked put. And yeah, I'm going out of the money. I know I've got to double up the, the risk there or the margin requirement to do this, okay? But that's okay because I'm getting more of the premium. Okay, just changing the strategy is not going to change your win-loss ratio if you're keeping the same criteria, okay? Would this make your winners look better on the 60% that you get assigned on? Yes, check. You might be making 6% instead of 3%, or let's call it 6% uh, instead of 4% to the upside if you're assigned. If the stock stays the same price, that 15% of the time or 20% of the time, it just middles about, you might be looking at a 1% or 2% return instead of a 1% or 0.5% return because of the extra premium. Yay. The 15% of the time the stock falls, you're losing twice as much as you would have adjusted the covered call. Okay? So, and I know it's, we could do 20 to 20 or 60, 15, 15, and, you know, whatever range is here. But think about it this way. Before going into the covered combination and thinking this is going to solve your problems, what I want you to do, Stanley, is take your average return of what you had on strategies that you feel aren't working for you right now. Take a look at your win-loss ratio, maybe the average of what you made on your winners and the average you lost on your losers. Now apply that to a structure of a covered combination and assume that if you kept the same percentage winners losers because you're not changing necessarily your stock picking criteria or your timing you're just changing a strategy what if your losers were almost twice as much percentage wise and your winners were maybe three percent higher and the break-even ones were actually a gain of one to two percent look at those numbers and see if this would pan out for you long term on the same trades you made last year I have a suspicion that if you put, took this structure and put it to your trading record last year for covered calls or a similar strategy, that this would come back to haunt you. And remember, if you don't take the loss in this position, the stock falls, you may end up now with 200 shares of Barrick Gold. Well, that's great. But what happens if you open five covered combinations for March expiration or April, and we do see that sell warning and the market pulls back, and you end up buying another 100 or 200 shares on all five positions? you may have up to 60% of your trading capital now invested into those 200 shares or 400 shares of what started out as a covered combination. Now it's just a long stock or a covered call. You sell a put again, then you might be able to buy more. Now you're putting more of that money into these positions that are actually going in the wrong direction. Remember, if you're getting put the stock at lower prices, you are averaging down, but this is a neutral to bullish strategy. You still want neutral to bullish positions. If... We're in a stagnant market. If you have the capital to do it, to put up twice as much capital to place the trade, and we're in a stagnant to neutral market, and you're better than I am, and you probably are, Stanley, uh, on a consistent basis of picking neutral to bullish stocks, this would outperform your covered call portfolio if you're trading covered calls the last 12 months. And by picking more winners more of the time and picking more neutral bullish stocks, I'm talking about 80% of the time, not 60% of the time, not 65 I'm saying that if you can pick stocks in the first 20, 30 days, uh, move up 1% or 2%, or maybe get the maximum return 80% of the time, this would absolutely outperform covered calls, maybe even leverage calendar spreads of what you've done in the last 12 or 15 months. If you've got about a 50-50 win-loss ratio, and you know that 20% of those ones you lose on usually lose big, about 10 or 15%, this strategy has the potential to murder your account because you're double dipping. You're gaining an extra 1% or 2% of the upside to take an extra potential 100% to the downside. You know that, I think, Stanley, you've heard me say I'm in that uh, married put with Ubiquity Networks, UBNT. Now, of course, I would also never trade a covered combination around earnings. Um, but UBNT, you saw what happened to me on that position. So I was in a married put here. 61.75, wrote it up to 64, lowered my risk, earnings came out, did the exact opposite of what I thought it was. I should have done a synthetic straddle at this point, right about here when I lowered my risk by moving up the put. I should have done a synthetic straddle, 
and I could close the position today for about a, I don't know, I think it's 16%, 17% gain with it down 25%. Stock's down 25%, okay? But this chart looks good, doesn't it? A little dip here, but this is going good. This is something that would look good for a covered call or anything. Of course, again, you wouldn't do it around earnings. If you entered this covered combination here, and you would have bought stock at 61.75, maybe sold the 62 and a half call and bought even the 57 and a half put. At this point, you've got another 100 shares here. You've lowered your cost basis probably down to about 58. And the stock is trading at 47.94, okay? With the covered call, you know, and then we're talking 200 shares here. 200 shares with an average cost of about 58 after taking the call premium, this cost, and the put premium. Lower your cost basis down to 58 for 200 shares. Stock's down to 48, so you got a $2,000 loss on an original investment of about $5,800. Whereas with the covered call, you'd have a 10-point loss on $5,800. You know, it's the balance, okay? Could the stock come back? Absolutely. Am I hoping the stock comes back? Absolutely. Would I be annoyed right now if I was in a covered combination this happened to me? Absolutely. <laughs> so that's my thoughts on the covered combination. I would suggest comparing your numbers, your win-loss ratios from last year, last 12 or 15 months, or 10 months or so. See how that would look on a standard covered combination setup um, to see how that works out for you. Okay. Valon says, last uh, question here, please explain that you mentioned you do not want iron condor when sell warning comes up. Yeah, I don't want an iron condor, Valon. I don't. I don't care if I go to an 80% probability on my iron condor, an 85% probability on my iron condor. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, I'm sorry, where I just lost it. Here we go, bing. All right, if I see a sell warning or anything like that up here, what I would probably want to do now is a bear call spread. I want to do one side of the directional. I don't want to do both, right? Because even if I go three, four, five, six percent of the money, even on a 14-day trade, for example, uh, weekly iron condors. Let's take a look here. All right, so let's take Tesla. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm just going to go to the profit and loss chart. Okay, let's hope I'm right in the middle. I'm pretty much right in the middle. Okay, so here's a Tesla at 251, weekly trade out to next week, not a recommendation, but selling the 265 and buying the 272 and a half call. So we're 14 points out of the money on Tesla. And on the other side, selling the 237.50, again, about 14 points out of the money. Okay? I see a sell warning. And Tesla drops 2% or $5 on Monday, we're in a down market, it drops another 2% or so, so another $5, now it's down 10 points, then it kind of comes back up, and then it drops another 2 or 3%, and we're down 6 points, okay, so now we're down below our short put strike price when the sell warning came up. Am I saying that every time I see a sell warning that I'm expecting the market to drop 2 to 3% each day for the next 4 or 5 days? No. But think about when you do have a market correction, what happens? It happens fast. All right, so if I'm opening positions today and I see the sell warning, I'm not considering an iron condor. I'm considering, knowing that we're near a top and we've had a little hesitation, I might open a bear call today that looked pretty attractive. I'm not saying this one looks attractive or this is one I would do, but I'd open the bear call. Then on Monday, if the stock, you know, is, is stable or it moves up even a little bit, maybe now I'll leg into the bull put. If I see that sell warning disappear, maybe now I'll open the bull put for the same expiration. But if it drops 3 or 4% on Monday, I'm not going to sell a bull put yet. And it drops another 2%, so I don't think I'm going to sell it yet. The, the market is alleviating itself, but why would I want to be in a position where this could be threatened even if I'm that far out in time? I want to give myself some time to see what's going on, get a feel for the market. I see a sell morning. I want to be doing bearish strategies. Goes to neutral. Now maybe consider doing the bull put. If it drops really quickly in the next two days, Monday and Tuesday, and the exchanges and the, the broad-based indexes drop pretty big in the next two days, and I see maybe a buy warning. That can happen. It can switch back real quick. And I see a buy warning. Now I'll open the bull put, and I'll evaluate if I can close my bear call early. Okay, so that's what I meant by that. If I see a sell warning, 
why am I going to mess with something even though it's a neutral spread and I've got wide ranges between and good probabilities 14 points out of the money. We've seen Tesla move more than 14 points in a day, not related to earnings or anything. That's a bad example, more volatile example, I understand. But that's why when I see a sell warning, why would I want to set myself up in a position? By the way, as a general, a general idea, uh, Ernie and myself have not opened a static iron condor position in probably the last 18 to 20 months. He and I have both maybe legged into an iron condor after opening a bear call first, seeing how the stock reacts, adding the bull put later, or adding the bull put and then adding the bear call. Both of us found in the 10 or 15 months previous to that 18 or 20 months ago that we were still losing on one side or the other of the spread. And you know, just based on what you know, we can look at here, Let's see what, uh, am I a 12 month? I am. See, just here alone, if I'd open an iron condor on or around March 17th of last, I'm oh, sorry, March 3rd of last year, okay, there was a gap there, but let's say I even did it after the gap. I opened an iron condor in seven days. I mean, the stock moved from 195, 190, yeah, 190, 195 to 210. That's in about a seven to eight day period, and then more, and then more, and then more, and then oops. Uh, you know, these are all, look at these, these are all like two-week movements, 10, 15, 20-day movements. Some of them are even one week. There's earnings, of course, wouldn't be there. Another seven-day trends, eight-day trend, 180 to back up to 210. So you probably, if the stock was, at, if Tesla was at 180, you wouldn't have sold the $30 out seven-day trade. You wouldn't have gotten anything for it, you know? <laughs> in that sense, you wouldn't have done that. And then here, okay, maybe here's where you would have made good money on the iron condor. Here's where you would have maybe made some good money on the iron condor. But here again, look at this. Every six to seven days, even if you're trading weeklies, if you're trading monthlies, you're getting blown through here. You're managing probably every 14 days. And then, oops. That's why the way the market has been in the last 12 months, last 15 months or so, and remember what we saw at the beginning of January 2016, blip. Remember? And then it came back up February, and then there was a little hiccup there, and then you know, down like that. Iron condor dead. Iron condor dead. <laughs> you know, you lose on the downside. The next one we do, we lose on the upside. Lose on the downside here. Good, good, good. Lose on the downside. Lose on the upside. Lose on the upside. Good probably in here. Good probably in here. Good probably in here. You know, you see where I'm, I, I know, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse, but that's, that's what we're looking at here, okay? So that's why... I've been sticking with opening one side or the other based on my market sentiment and then maybe legging in later. Wesley asked a question, is it profitable as a day trade options? I can't answer that question. I've never tried to do it. I have no interest in doing it personally. Okay, I, I don't want to try to make nickels and dimes. <laughs> it's a poor example, not to say that I'm a poor person or I'm a poor trader, but as a poor example, I had that again. I had that 34 strike on eBay today. And the stock, you know, was about at uh, 33, 80, 33, 86 at the open. I was panicking, you know. I waited to the end of the day, but I was watching it. I was refreshing almost every two to three minutes in that last 20 minutes or so. I've got other things to do, <laughs> you know, write articles and do prepare for webinars and uh, work on other projects and work on other um, products, I should say, as well. That's my job, Wesley. But yeah, I had to spend 15 minutes refreshing and watching it to make sure it didn't go up to, you know, jump from 33.74 up to 33.80. We all know what happens sometimes in the last 15 to 20 minutes in the market. I even sent out a brief to all of my customers at uh, the Fusion subscription that might be following my trade. At 3.05, I said, well, stock's at 33.74. I don't expect it to, to move above 34, so I'm not going to close it. If you wanted to, you could close it now for about $0.04 cents at midpoint. But I'm not going to. I'm going to wait. But be prepared, if it goes up above 34 and we get a sign, I'm going to have to do something different on Monday and so on and so forth <laughs> as well. But any, I'm sorry, in any case, I, I, I was just for one option. And I was worried about four cents. You know, I was just, whoa. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. So no, I don't have the stomach or the time to day trade options. I don't have the time. Ernie would kill me. He, he would stop paying me. 
they, they would stop paying me for my services if I would say trading options. So I wouldn't have the time to do anything else. No coaching sessions, no webinars, no other products, no articles, no blogs, nothing. I essentially wouldn't be working for power options. So I don't know how many people are successful day trading options, to tell you the truth, because you're fight a lot of times you're fighting over small amounts. You gotta trade the bigger positions. We're talking about Priceline, Amazon, to see dollar fifty, two dollar movements and catch the right timing. I don't think you could day trade some of the positions we were looking at earlier. And we saw GM. That's not going to do anything. It moves up 80 cents in the day. You're probably going to see 10, 15 cents on the option contract. If you're out of the money, of course, assuming you're selling. But, I mean, how many contracts do you have to do to make that worthwhile? You know, you're, you're battling time. And you can't. there aren't options that expire every day. You know, like a stock. A stock, you know, what the delta is, day trading. With the option, it's almost a drop in the bucket what you see movements on a regular basis. Market's flat during the day. Options are going to change five or ten cents. How many contracts do you need to make that worth your while to sell it and then buy it back at the end of the day or to buy it and sell it at the end of the day if there's a five cents difference from 35 cents to 40? How many contracts? And then what's that going to do to your margin? Eh, it's not my game. So, all right. Jeff, uh, real quick question here. Of course, we're going to wrap up. We're going to stop soon here. It is 5.50. Jeff asks, adjusting credit spread. Is there an archive presentation addressing this topic? There's about four of them. Okay, but let me point you in the right direction. First, Jeff, go to the webinars page. Go to option strategies. Uh, the first one you want to look at here is managing your bear call credit spread. This is the seven ways to manage or adjust your bear call credit spread that moves against you. This is was done after... About a year ago, more than that, first one in 2014 was managing your spread positions. So I did a full webinar on the seven or eight ways we look to manage a bull put, bear call, bull call debit, bear put debit. But I know most people like the credit, so we did a webinar a little bit a year after that on managing just your bull put credit spread, the seven ways to manage your bull put spread. And investors asked, well, yeah, but I don't want to translate that in reverse to bear calls. Can you do one for me on bear call credits? There you go, managing your bear call spread. So you got them both. Now, I don't have one on managing iron condors. Why? Because the same way I'd manage an iron condor is contained in here. Because remember, only one side is going to go against me or the other. So if the bear call starts to lose on my iron condor, I'm going to apply one of these potential ways to manage the side that's getting threatened, the bear call. On the bull put, if the stock falls, I'm going to use these seven ways I talk about here to manage the bull put. I'll leave the other side alone. The bull put gets threatened in my iron condor, I leave the bear call alone. If the stock's moving up, my bear call's being threatened, I leave the bull put alone, I just address what's being attacked. Also, Jeff, uh, I decided to trim this down a little bit. Instead of having 12 to 15 webinars here from the uh, archive webinars, we're just going to keep about one month in a row. I haven't been able to adjust the dates yet, but this is the one from January 27th. This is the one from February, I can't remember, 2nd? No, it would have been 20. This is 224, 217, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I know I'm, I'm sort of here. 2 3. I'm sorry. February 3rd, 217, 224. These are the archive webinars from the last Friday sessions. And you can see there the titles right here 3317, a brief discussion on adjusting spreads. Editing the power of his portfolio, adjusting spreads, earnings, and radioactive trades. Um, here's one on weekly credit spreads, search, and exit triggers. We don't talk about management. We talk about the exit triggers. And then we had a question last week here. Um, so those are two you'd want to look at as well. These would give you some real quick introductions, actually. What are the triggers one might use? It's about 10, 15-minute portion of this webinar. Adjusting spreads, about a 20-minute, 20 25-minute portion of this webinar. And then full presentations under option strategies for managing your bear call credit spread and further down the list, managing your bull put credit spread as well. Lots of information for you. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, 5.50 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I think I've, I've seen all the questions that have come in. I want to thank you all, of course, for uh, uh, joining me today um, as well. Yeah, it's happy hour time now, Jeff. I agree. I do agree completely. Uh, for those of you that have uh, joined us today, of course, you haven't checked out Power Options, remember just go to www.powerop.com. You can put in your first name, last name, and email address, and you'll have full access to the 14-day free trial without any credit card information. Uh, of course, if you want uh, other uh, the subscription levels after that, I'm sorry, after the 
14-day free trial. We do offer an end-of-day service, which is only $40 per month. Uh, that means that the uh, data updates only at the end of the day. The most popular one is our delayed service, a 20-minute delayed, which is $60 per month. We do offer a real-time service. We do have historical tools available as well. You'll see all that on the subscription page. Want to look at some other free information? You can always check out our blog. Just go to blog.powerop.com. There's a search function there where you can, of course, scroll through different topics uh, that you're interested in. We showed the webinar page several times. Remember, you can do that at any time. Go to powerop.com slash webinars.asp. It is a public page. You do not need a trial. You do not need to be logged in to access it. Of course, we also have a YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube, uh, search uh, Power Options, all one word, and you'll be able to see many archive videos just like this in addition to the ones that are on the webinar page. Finally, next week, Wednesday, March 8th, 12 noon Eastern time, we're going to go through our criteria for calendar spreads. Last week we had our presentation on just, um, I'm sorry, looking at the uh, different structures of the various types of calendar spreads, diagonal versus horizontal and reversal and so forth. But Wednesday we're going to go a little bit more in depth. We're going to talk about search criteria and setting up a trade. And then, of course, Friday, March 11th, uh, March 10th, uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, as always, we'll be back for our regular open discussion Q&A session. Sorry that pause because I was laughing at myself for adding three days to Wednesday and saying that was Friday, March 11th, and not realizing it's March 3rd, and I just need to add seven days, and it would have been March 10th. So it's me laughing at myself. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you think of any questions before going over any of the archive webinars, or something maybe we didn't get today or something you want to refresh in your mind, remember you can send us an email at any time to support at powerop.com. If you have questions about the radioactive trading techniques, remember you can send us an email at any time to support it, radioactivetrading.com. You can also reach us during market hours, of course. You can call us at the office at 302-992-7971. Uh, if you live inside the U.S., you can actually use us toll-free at 877-992-7971. And those of you that are on your trial membership or subscribers to Power Options, remember uh, you can go ahead and schedule that coaching session at any time. Uh, you just click on the free coaching session, and you'll be able to select the time that matches your schedule during the trading day. All right. Well, Wesley and uh, Valan, of course, and Jeff, uh, everyone else, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for your excellent questions. I did record today's presentation. I'll get that posted for you sometime this weekend. And again, you'll see that in that requested topics section. And I'll let everyone know when this webinar is archived as well. Have a fantastic weekend. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you soon.